Pan and Texter in the home, what do you think? Have you got happy memories of Granny's front room wallpaper, all big, bosomy cabbage roses? Safe, comforting, but a little dowdy. Or are you fascinated by how sensual, how exciting pattern and texture can be? Either way, I know what you're thinking. I know that you're thinking that pattern and texture are difficult to use. They're scary. But like so much else in interior design, there are basic rules there to help you get it right. Texture and pattern are closely related design elements. Using texture is neither difficult nor expensive, but it's so often overlooked. There is something inherently satisfying about a repeated design, and every culture has evolved different ways of making patterns. Pattern has never been so widely accessible, but like every other element in the interior, you need to know how to use it successfully. Here in our secret scientific studio laboratory, we've recreated the average British room, and I'm gonna use this to show you how pattern and texture can soften sharp angles, create a period atmosphere, even trick you into thinking that a room is bigger than it actually is. We'll find out how certain patterns have a phenomenal ability to disguise badly proportioned rooms. Nowadays, busy, exciting patterns are more often to be found on gallery walls, or in this case, floors. Now, I'm not saying that you should have stripes on your living room floor. I just want you to be a little less timid when thinking about pattern because pattern is a brilliant carrier for personality. Think romantic, think florals, think cabbage roses, think gardens of romance, think poppy. Think swirly, think nightclubby, think scary, sexy images, think pinstripe, think upright, think stiff upper lip, think damask, rich, sexy, sensual damask, think Venice, think Florence. Ooh, I need a cold shower. Attitudes towards pattern in Britain go in cycles. Fashions come and fashions go, taste and style go round in a great big wheel like that. At the end of the last century, pattern was at the top of the fashion cycle. The Victorians adored pattern. The Houses of Parliament and the Palace of Westminster are great examples of Victorian Gothic, unrestrained interiors. From the 1840s through to the 1930s, Britain had a love affair with pattern. Indeed, most of our houses were designed with pattern in mind. Houses like this. Most of the houses in this country were built for pattern in that most of the houses in this country were built between 1880 and 1930, the heyday of pattern. And in fact, pattern then was actually a social issue. When you think that pattern is not essential for life, it's not essential for comfort, it's not essential for living, it's a twiddly bit you add on at the end when you've got a bit of money. So therefore, the more pattern you've got, theoretically, the posher you are. And that's why you end up with rooms like this. But pattern can be used in a modern way, and this house does have great potential. Remember, the first thing you need to do before you start any work is really understand the room. It's, it's, it's a nice space, actually. For its, for its girth, it's got quite a high ceiling, and there's a huge amount of light flooding in. Obviously, a south-facing window. Um, rather eccentric picture rail height, which worries me slightly. And, of course, there's no aesthetically satisfying focal point, no fireplace, just a black squat television in the corner. Sort of thing you see all over the place. How often do you see pattern like this, though? I mean, this is scary. This is borderline criminal. So how has pattern managed to murder this room? Let's conduct an autopsy. It boils down to two basic fatal blows to the heart, scale and balance. Scale's wrong and there's no balance at all. 
My rescue package in here revolves around pattern and texture. There's a lot of hard, quite sharp architecture, which would do well to be softened by the right kind of wallpaper, right kind of scale, right kind of colorway. And then take out the picture rail, run the pattern right the way up so it meets the ceiling to draw attention to the height of the room. Natural materials, gorgeous textures that you can caress with your fingertips and enjoy with your eye. Pattern is usually one of the first things we see when we go into a room. I can't imagine anyone managing to dodge this wallpaper visually. It's worth remembering that the eye is constantly seeking out stimulation and an area of pattern when it's used correctly will always act as an eye magnet for your mind to explore it, to get interest from it. But it's not just us grown-ups that feel like this. Science has proved that we need a certain level of visual stimulation at a very early age. Our visual development relies on an understanding of pattern. Experiments have been carried out by vision scientists to understand how babies learn to see by monitoring brain waves the responses to various patterns are measured. The results have shown that babies are always more interested in busy patterns. The brain needs stimulation in order to develop and a certain degree of patterning on a wallpaper is probably a good idea, something to develop the visual part of the brain, which is at the back here, which, which is, responds to orientations of lines, to patterns, and then, of course, to objects as well. So if you don't give it enough stimulation, the back of the brain, the visual part, probably won't develop properly. On the other hand, if you give it too much and you really blast it with all sorts of complicated jazzy patterns, that could be a jolly bad idea. And I don't know exactly what the optimum is, but I suspect that wallpaper designers have quite a responsibility for nursery wallpapers. In our brains, we have little neurons that respond to lines and edges and bars. So if you have a very busy pattern, a lot of these neurons are stimulated and you'll see a lot of brain activity. If, on the other hand, you have a blank wall, far fewer neurons will be stimulated and you'll show far less brain activity. This is something we've known since the 1970s or earlier. So what's interesting is that busy, bright patterns are very arousing. They get our visual system going. Whereas plain blank colors, we've our you know, make our visual system respond much less. And there seems to be a happy medium between how much we want to be stimulated and how much we want to be soothed. We, complete sensory deprivation is not a pleasant experience, but equally, living in a tiny room with flock wallpaper and different matching sofas is also very unpleasant. We like a compromise. So, if human beings are instinctively drawn to and excited by pattern, and we've all grown up in a country with such a rich pattern heritage, then why now are we so scared to surround ourselves with the stuff? There is an immense range of pattern available, but you have to be careful about what you choose. Understanding how pattern works is nothing like as complicated as swanky upmarket designers would have you believe whilst charging through the nose for their advice. If you look at this paper, there are two reasons why this sits so well in the room. The first is the fact that the pattern is derived or inspired from patterns of the period of the house. But much more importantly, I think it works because of scale. So why is that? Let's go back to the studio. With wallpaper, there's a very, very basic design rule, which is to understand the relationship between the size of the pattern and the size of the wall. What you don't want to do is that. Subdivide your wall into blocks, in this instance, 60 centimeters square, that thoroughly draw attention to the fact that you've only got four up and however many across. Wallpaper has the most fantastic ability to draw a veil over dodgy proportions. Getting the pattern and the scale right means that you no longer see your low ceiling or your short wall. Having said that this is so bad, don't start thinking, well, I'm never going to use a white wall with a black grid on it. Imagine this is a more conventional wallpaper with a flower there. 
a flower there, a flower there, a flower there, a flower there. You're going to spend the whole time counting the flowers. So, the first rule to understand is how scale and strength of pattern has to be carefully chosen for the room. Too bold a pattern, as in here, will have the effect of closing down a space. It's one thing being so brutally dismissive about a wallpaper being the wrong scale, but what does that mean? If you look at this wallpaper, there's a dominant feature, which, uh, should we call it a cannabis leaf, just for the sake of argument? And then, measuring the space in between the cannabis leaves vertically, We've got about 70 centimetres, which is about 28 inches. Now, what has happened is that because the picture rail's so low, we've only got three cannabis leaves in a row. Instantly, the ceiling's been brought down and the room's been brought in. This wallpaper, scarily, would in fact look better in a much larger room. So, what sort of wallpaper should we have in our room? Three classic traditional wallpapers, each one showing a completely different approach to pattern. What I find quite interesting is the fact that a hundred years ago, each of these would have been huge, massive, great big patterns designed for lovely, huge, stately rooms. But now, they've been completely redrawn, completely redesigned to fit our kind of spaces. In fact, to fit into a room like this. This is a quite straightforward repeat. You've got one motif which just goes up nine times. And I mean, that's lovely, nine whole repeats, even in a low ceilinged room. This is a bit more geometric. I mean, I can't even be bothered to count the amount of fleur de lis. But the idea is, it's a quite simple grid pattern. The motif itself is cut very, very small, so you're not drawing attention to the lowness of the ceiling. Now this one in the middle is an extraordinarily clever pattern. It has no beginning, it has no end. It's almost impossible to discern where the motif is. You pick up a flower, try and find its twin, try and find its mate, and it becomes a blur. So the three distinct types of pattern are florid, geometric, and this one, which is naturalistic. The idea being that the pattern is arranged as things grow in nature, off-center, lopsided. And because that's naturalistic, because that's like nature, it's almost like camouflage. Wallpaper design has always been closely related to technology. In the 18th century, printing relied on woodcuts, a time-consuming and expensive process that required exquisite accuracy. The most complicated papers may have needed 35 separate printings. Needless to say, today, a hand-blocked paper like this one is so expensive, even I can't afford it. From 1840, patterned wallpaper became available to the masses and remained at the forefront of interior design right through until the 60s, when it really was the only way to keep up with the Joneses. The new Crown vinyl wall covering. John's just finished papering with it. <laughs> worry. No problem at all with crown vinyl wall covering. But why did he throw the trifle at it? He doesn't like trifle. <laughs> he doesn't like coffee either. Today, design technology allows manufacturers to react to consumer demand at the click of a mouse. There are over 10,000 wallpaper designs on the market, and yet most of you still opt for the safest and the simplest range. You know, it breaks my heart. We make, uh, as an industry, 75 million rolls a year. Um, that's enough to go around the world 18 times, so there's plenty of choice out there for people. Um, but what tends to sell um, the best are subtle textured patterns in very subtle colours. Um, probably the reason for this is that um, in the last housing boom in the late 80s people were quite happy to be individual and themselves but this time around we're seeing that people are being actively encouraged to almost market their homes and sort of depersonalize them to a certain extent and keep them very neutral. Mm -hmm. 
But you see, I do understand you lot, and because I know you're all pattern scaredy cats, I've chosen a very subtle but nevertheless elegant floral pattern for the front room at number 37. The other changes I want to make in here include reinstating the fireplace to provide a more pleasing focal point than the television, and the picture rail has to go. Because I have absolutely no intention of using the picture rail to hang pictures from, I feel quite comfortable in the concept of removing it altogether because I want this room to be an uninterrupted sea of pattern from the skirting right the way up to the ceiling. Elegant, dignified, restrained, but homely. Had I chosen a geometric design of wallpaper for this room, the effect would have been completely different. Geometric patterns often derive inspiration from our classical past. And in fact, the late Georgians used them to draw attention to the rhythm and symmetry of their architecture. Lines are obviously the most simplistic of all the geometric patterns, but you have to be very careful with lines because lines can have the most bizarre effect on a room, whatever its size. An extreme example of how lines can change a space, here the artist Jim Lambie has changed our perception of the Tate Gallery by applying coloured tape to the floor. The stripes make the space feel significantly longer. Now, believe it or not, this does relate to our homes. Let's go back to the studio. An extremely well-proven design rule when it comes to using geometric pattern is that vertical lines make a space feel higher. Now, the reason why vertical lines make a space feel taller relates to how our eyes are drawn to stripes. The eye likes to travel up the line. It enjoys the journey. There's an easy way to demonstrate this. The muller liar illusion is one of the most famous visual tricks. Two lines of equal length are drawn. Arrowheads are then drawn on one line, inverted arrows on the other. No question which line looks longer now. So why is that? It's actually explained by eye movements. And one of the reasons I like this is it also explains a very common factor in interior decorating. So in the muller liar illusion, when you have arrows on either side of the line and your eye movements travel along the line, they stop at the points of the arrows. However, when you have the line flanked by the reversed arrows, the eye movements can travel up the arrows and they're not stopped as abruptly. Now that might explain why, if you want to make a room look taller, you use vertical striped wallpaper. The eye can travel up and down the stripes of the wallpaper and that makes the room seem taller in the same way as allowing the eye to travel back and forth across the muller liar illusion allows the line to seem longer. It's not just geometric patterns that are so good at tricking the eye. Curvy patterns, naturalistic patterns, florid patterns, floral patterns, all of them do a very good job at camouflaging imperfections in a room. William Morris's designs are great for this. By imitating nature, wallpapers like this take the eye away from lumps and bumps in the plasterwork. The next step is to understand how to successfully combine patterns. And boy, have I got somewhere to show you. And now for pattern lovers everywhere, the joy of pattern and texture. This is the Mayfair home of interior designer Alidad. It's a one-off, a brave, bold, daring fusion of all sorts of patterns and texture. So what's going on here? Why does this work? Is there a cookery book type recipe that explains how this interior looks so good? I mean, one thing's for sure, it uses an enormous amount of spice and a lot of flavors. So how are those balanced? There are three basic guiding rules that pulls this off. The first rule is actually not really so much of a rule, really more of a just a, 
an informal attitude. It all looks terribly clever. It all looks terribly contrived. Actually, I think it's terribly relaxed. It's just a question of a tide of things coming in and out and eventually settling down and saying, hmm, that works there, hmm, that works there. That's what makes it innately quite so relaxing, quite so informal. So, the next rule is that there has to be something that binds it all together. And the most obvious thing here is red. It's the colour. Red's a great base for this kind of project because it doesn't clash with itself. That's one red, that's another red, that's another red. But it all just sort of sits together. So, colour is the thing that is completely wrapping it together. The next thing that makes it work is this concept of family resemblance. All of the patterns, all of the textures have a relationship with each other like grandpa to grandson, like great aunt Maud to her niece. And in this instance, the family resemblance is based on geography and culture in that most of the patterns in here are derived from Islam. And then the final rule, the clever rule, is scale back to scale. Okay, imagine that all the pattern on the wall disappears instantly. It's gone. It's just plain red. Look at the sofa, look at the table. What's the thing you see first? That. Huge, giant, great big red poppy heads being a very, very badly behaved attention-seeking pattern in the corner of the room. Totally engulfing and totally swamping the more delicate patterns on the sofa and the carpet. What's so clever about this space is that that is not the biggest, not the most eye-catching pattern in the room at all, because look, look at the pattern on the walls. That is huge. That is instantly reducing the scale of these things. The other thing that works so well about the pattern on the wall is the fact that there's very little contrast in there. It's knocked back, it's aged, it's very, very well behaved. And this, of course, is the other end of the pattern spectrum. Discreet, polite, the perfect background. Little teeny tiny decorating tip. Another advantage of this kind of design is that it's really easy to line up. Go on, have a go. So what is this pattern doing for this room? Fundamentally, it's distracting the eye, taking the mind away from the corners and the edges. It's flattening the space off, but at the same time making it more homely. When you think about it, pattern is nothing more than two-dimensional texture. It's visual texture. But why not make that leap and actually go for a room you can touch and feel? So, what is texture and what job does it do at home? Think about the softness of carpet. And then think about shiny, hard ceramic floor tiles. Think about stone walls against silk wall coverings. The thing about texture is that it can communicate luxury as efficiently as it can communicate simplicity. So, back to number 37, where some decisions need to be made. I've got a series of gorgeous things which I need to pick and mix and match together to create a mood board for this room. Um, so, I'm looking at everything that I've got, and I've got uh, a bit of wool carpet with a nice texture to it. That seems to fit rather nicely. This stone with a hole, that's going rather well there. Um, rough wooden frame, that's all beginning to look rather nice. Nice bit of natural linen as well. Things that aren't looking so good are things like that. It's rather grown up, it's a bit too grand in a way, even though the colour's quite good. That is not good. It's urban, it's man-made, it just seems to be scary with everything that's going on there. And that seems to be sitting very nicely together. In fact, there seems to be some kind of family resemblance going on there, a very happy family resemblance. The very happy family that is natural texture. Roughness, naturalness, the homespun, those aren't the only textures, of course. In fact, imagine how dull the world would be if they were. 
Texture can also be silky, it can be glossy, it can be luxurious, it can be refined. Texture is extremely important to humans, I think because we're so tactile, but it remains one of the most undervalued of all the senses. Babies perhaps see the world as two-dimensional until they're able to grasp things and reach for things. And then they start putting this touch and this visual information together to understand the world in three dimensions. And one of the things that's striking about babies is between about four and seven months, they spend a lot of time looking at objects, grabbing them and looking at them and grabbing them. That's what they're doing at that age. They're learning how to integrate their touch and their reaching behavior and their sense of depth. My own opinion is that touch is actually the primary sense, really more important than vision, and that vision depends on touch. That if we hadn't handled objects, dropped things, broken things, drunk from mugs, hit things and so on as children, as babies, then the image in the eye would really be meaningless. It would just be a load of patterns and not evidence for objects. Hurrah for science! But what you need to remember in the house is one simple fact. Think about the textures you're using. Are they shiny? Are they hard? And then try and mix them, or preferably balance them as much as possible. One of the most important rules you need to understand about texture is it needs light. And it needs light like a flower needs rain. I know I've told you this before, but it is important. Understanding how daylight affects a room is a fundamental rule of design. Maximizing daylight in a room will bring out the best in textured features or objects. I mean, look how good I look. Light isn't the only thing to be affected by texture. Texture has huge impact on sound as well. Take these floor coverings. The different textures will affect the way that noises sound in a room. Back at number 37, work is complete. Remember this room? By replacing the greyish wallpaper with this elegant floral pattern, the room feels significantly larger. Removing the picture rail has also helped make the room feel taller. By reinstating the fireplace, the room once again has a principal focal point. Fabric is always going to be one of the key textural elements. Here, the red shiny material used on the sofa contrasts with the natural textures in the room and provides visual interest. The design in this room relies on texture and pattern to give it the warmth and character that it was so lacking before. So, pattern can be modern, pattern can be well behaved, which is very, very good news for a room like this, in fact any room, because of course pattern smooths over the bumps and fills in the hollows. And then there's texture. I mean, why not walk into a room where all of the senses are indulged and touch is just so, well, sensual? Although there are certain textures which are probably best left unfelt. Mind the cactus, boys. Could pattern and texture affect your room? Could you use them to your advantage? Find out more on our website, www.bbc.co.uk stroke homes. Next week, Design Rules is all about how the finishing touches in a room can transform a house to a home. <laughs>